would you visit with these judges? Six of them have been visited. Japan, China, South, South America, Louisiana. But the seventh one is here. The seventh one was the East Coast of the United States. And also the so weekend. Ones. But I got some breaking news headlines that many of you over in the East Coast, I know, are preparing for. What am I talking about? What is this storm that is coming up out of the woodwork, apocalyptic in nature? <laughs> boy, oh boy. Again, many of you may have heard this, some of you may have not. But this storm called Frankenstorm? Oh yes, that's what the media is headlining it as because this is how big the storm is. Back in 1991, there was a huge storm uh, called the Perfect Two days storm. ago on the 26th out to the people of America and to around the world. Well, I was given a prophetic warning dream about another upcoming storm coming to America. This is not I repeat, not the Hurricane Sandy that is now hitting the East Coast. 2012, in the early evening, the messenger angel of God brought on this message to Benjamin Consignzi. Shalom. I greet you in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. My name is Thunder. You will be visited by the Lord of hosts with a great bang, wind, storm, and rain cause damage above the American capital, Washington. 20 to 40 hours long. Preparing to come to shore in the next few hours. And there is absolutely a very powerful storm surge that's coming up on uh, the East Coast. Looks as if it's going to go right uh, right toward between Washington. Most of you know by now, nature is showing her hand for this year. Sandy is sweeping throughout the eastern coast lines this morning. She's due to come all the way up into Maine from Florida. And as you know, there's been a lot of talk about what type of damage is expected to occur. But I pose the question, is this nature showing her hand? Or is it an act of God where God is angry with man, his disobedience, his wickedness, or is this man's doing? You know, most people understand what harp is. The Bible says it is a Bible prophecy storm. Matter of fact, I was on the phone yesterday with Pastor Evans of the Harvest Army Church International. We discussed the biblical ramifications of this storm and the fact that a prophecy came forth. Moving down here to Sandy, guys, which is a big story at this point. Sandy is a very unique and unprecedented storm, okay? Guys, this is a very serious heads up. Uh, it may not have any impact on the, the United States. But it very well could, guys, and things are really starting to, to point to the idea that this is going to be a record-breaking storm for the Northeast as well as uh, other parts of the coast. Sandy has a very... Yes, whoa. I, I don't know whether to laugh or cry at that. I, I uh, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, it, okay. So today the weather report for Washington, D.C. is as uh, follows, okay? Washington, D.C. Let me read it to you so that you get an idea. Oh, I have it right here. Okay. So the Washington weather today, uh, high will be 45 degrees and there will be uh, rain all day, light rain and humidity 81%. Um, 
you know, probably about an inch or so. And, uh, and that's, that's about it. Uh, this storm, according to the uh, prophecy experts, was supposed to wipe out Washington, D.C. and be the storm of the century that then would be the final judgment of God, kind of like uh, another Katrina or perhaps, uh, you know, I mean, like any other disaster in the world. And then you have the conspiracy bloggers talking about um, Harp and engineering the storm into uh, New Jersey and, and the outlying areas. The perfect storm, Frankenstorm, because it's combining with a cold front. Not supposed to be at this time, uh, this storm. It is supposed to be a... Um, what can I say? It's supposed to be, let me get a little more level. <laughs> okay, there's a little more level. Um, it's supposed to be a storm that um, is apocalyptic in nature, and, and, and I'm not here to disagree completely about that. I'm just here to weigh in on kind of a, something that I have kind of gleaned from it all. And it's like, yes, there's a warning here. There's, it's not really about the storm. It's more about the anomalous, um, freakish nature of it or supernatural nature of it. And in a sense, people are saying they're picking up on that, but then they're, they're all uh, appending all kinds of their own personal um, angst to it in the sense of Washington, D.C., and it's going to hit that, and it's going to hit the president, it's going to hit America for Halloween. Here it is, October 31st. And, of course, Halloween, you'd expect that I would uh, weigh in and say something, anything, um, you know, whatever word to share, and that's what I'm going to really try to do is uh, render the things that I have to tell you, which have been storing up over time, let's say. And I've been, like you, my blood has been boiling, watching the corruption in Washington, D.C., watching the Benghazi uh, debacle, watching so many things that um, are just unprecedented and unnecessary. And it's hard to watch. So the, the U.S. election being the most contentious and probably the most evil in um, ever, uh, the um, the great divide of the two ways. In other words, you have the way of Satan, which is usually the way of communism, uh, totalitarianism, lack of freedom for the individual, a lack of um, respect, a um, lying where everyone knows it's a lie, but then the media and the supporters of uh, especially Obama, jumping in with the lies, covering up everything, handicapping if the storm would be good for Obama or not. Um, f- forget about the safety of the people. It's all about that. It doesn't matter how many people die. It doesn't matter about the Benghazi cover-up and lies. The news media blacked it out except for Fox News. And I've been, you know, sitting here held hostage by all this since the last podcast on, I, I believe it was the 26th of October, And here we are, once again, in the midst of the prophecy smackers going off the rails, and they're either doing harp and a combination of God's wrath using man, or they're doing, um, I had a dream, this confirms a prophecy I had four years ago, and they all jumped on it. Uh, We heard one guy there that he's he's all over the internet with it, and they jump on it. And again, the key is keying in on Washington, D.C. That's really the target of God's wrath, and that's where the storm's going to hit. It's going to break the Washington Monument in two, which, of course, I I wouldn't mind seeing that um, for other reasons, because the symbol is of hell. It's a symbolic hell. It's like you're saying, yes, my God is hell, and pain and suffering will be our way. And it's like, that's not America. That's not the way. Um, that's not what America stood for. America was for the freedom of the individual flowing from the creator and freedom of worship for people, a a last bastion of hope in the world. Not, um, obviously, we've fallen pretty far. And a lot of this is the fault of our generation. 
that, you know, I can chime in for myself and say that, you know, I repent and I have repented, but, you know, I was also wanting to cash in on the me generation and get something for myself until I finally realized not only is it not about me, but it's not in my comfort level. It's just not about that. It's not about me. It's not about my comfort level. And it's not about wanting the wrath of God because I feel hurt and I think it's deserved. So I'm going to put God in a box and say, God's doing this when he isn't doing that. Where are the voices of prophecy? Um, Where are the voices of prophecy? They are not to be found because it may be the deafening silence of prophets is in part a judgment. The storm isn't about the storm. The storm is symbolic. There is a supernatural signature on it, and there's people that have looked at the radar and said it doesn't look like a harp signature. So the freakish nature, the supernatural nature, the warning of the storm, the announcement or the blowing of the shofar that, yes, the division of the sheep and goats has been accomplished The sides have been chosen. The election is symbolic of two sides being chosen. The sides have been chosen. The, there is no healing between the sides. There never really was, you know, people um, throughout when I was a child and then the people of the prior generation and the one before that, there was never a reconciliation or some kind of, um, how shall I put it? Some kind of, uh, agreement between two sides. There was the collectivist, progressive, uh, atheist, which is also a religion, which is Satanism. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the hallmark of that is uh, partial birth abortion and, um, um, you, you know, a focus on, you know, ourselves as gods, uh, as in the collective, and a vow to bring poverty to the entire world, like as, as in Venezuela as in uh, Honduras, where they voted out the free city that would bring tremendous amounts of jobs, but they voted again for poverty. In other words, they were told what to vote for, and they vote for poverty. A vote for Barack Obama is also a vote for poverty. They would rather have poverty and be in their collective. And you go, why don't they learn in the ghetto, you know, that the, um, that the, Leaders that they've chosen want to keep them there because that's their power base. So they have a a vested interest in keeping them there rather than power to the individual to create. And this is the subject of Ayn Rand novels. It's the subject of a lot of thinkers, whether they're they're, um, and philosophers, whether they are religious or not. It doesn't matter. The storm is the division of the two ways. Just prior to the election, the timing of the storm shows me that. It's the two ways in collision. There won't be a healing between, say, Democrats and Republicans, between Satanists and Christians, between um, Muslims and Christians, and and the other religions are not really that relevant because it's all centering. Reality kind of centers around the truth, and the truth is another name for Christ, but Christ is another name for Creator, which is another name for reality. So you're either with reality or you're in a bubble of unreality. And the people that are in reality are vilified by the world that wants to stay asleep and stay controlled and stay poor and stay uh, at war and stay miserable versus uh, a shining city on the hill, a beacon of hope versus um, the idea of um, creation of, you know, prosperity, creation of wealth, creation of... um, Jobs, creation of livelihoods, the, the, the blessing that the Bible is very kind of adamant on saying that truly the blessed have, um, are able to benefit to the third generation. And so one asks, well, where is that? It seems that anything that has to do with wealth or anything is, is absolutely evil. Um, you know, the creation of wealth would be the creation of jobs, businesses, you know, uh, prosperity in general which is the, it seems that this is really the fight, at least politically, to either stop prosperity in the name of creating it or create it but then be vilified by the world. Um, Individual rights and liberty that flow from the creator is is the center of the conflict. And they don't want individual rights flowing from the creator. 
they don't want to acknowledge there is a creator. You're just responsible to yourself and to your group, whatever group that is. And, you know, anything else besides the pursuit of creator, the pursuit of a relationship with God through Jesus, the pursuit of truth, which is in itself a search for truth. Anything other than that would be a search or a continuation of a lie. The continuation of the lie is there to, um, as I said, creating poverty and lack and, you know, a kind of um, a nanny government as God, as they've done in Europe, as they've done with the dictators in South America, as they've done, um, you know, in Russia, as they've done in China. And it, it's just, it goes on like that. And, and the people in general, the masses, are in poverty. The masses are suffering. The masses keep voting, yearning, uh, bowing down, uh, demanding to be taken care of by other humans. And humanity cannot take care of itself. Right now what we're facing is a mass, and I'm not here to go against the gloom and doom prophecies. I'm here to underscore those that, yes, if we continue, someone has to pay a debt that can't be paid. If you overwhelm the system with debt, then there must be a purge. Because if people can't pay one way, they must then pay with blood. And the, it, whether it's in the form of a World War III, whether it's in the form of um, a civil war and martial law, whether it's in the form of having property rights confiscated, uh, which is the, the communist way, which is the way of the people in power today in America. And in a sense, that's also a judgment against people who either took it for granted, went to sleep, and <laughs> a great fault, a great blame goes to the entire evangelical Christian community who um, refused to speak up about the situation and assumed, as they did in the church in Adolf Hitler's Germany, that the state is ordained by God and therefore it should be worshipped or honored, I won't say worship, but honored, um, you, you know, that it came from God. And how you get that Adolf Hitler or Obama or anybody else came from God uh, in, in this situation when they're condoning murder of babies, for example. I mean, partial birth abortion, let's just go over that for a second. What is partial birth abortion? It is the baby being born but being artificially, the head being held into the womb, into the cervix, into the birth canal. So the whole baby is actually born and then inserting a... Um, so the baby's alive and born and a living, breathing being, human being, and then murdering it by sticking a suction device into the brains and sucking the brains out, and there you have partial birth abortion, which this president voted for uh, again and again, and, and also his wife, and they are champions of partial birth abortion. And if you are championing that, then you will do everything satanic, like Hollywood, like, you know, all the other things we see that we have to endure. And um, we keep saying we want to do something about this abortion uh, issue, especially the partial birth murder of living soul beings. These are soul beings. And there's a reason why uh, this exists. And the reason why it exists is because... Um, because, again... The human sacrifice angle of Satanism is extremely important, and it is a right. It's a religious right, and it must be maintained. From time immemorial, abortion has been a right, whether it be a sacrifice unto Molech, as it says in the Bible, and I'm going to get my Bible out here in a second, but um, it's been a little difficult for me to learn this Bible reader, you know, so, you know, but you know what it says. It basically says that... Um, People have corrupted, uh, you know, their people are corrupt and um, they are basically um, gone astray. Everyone has gone his own way, as it says in the Proverbs, as it says in Psalms, as it says throughout the Bible. And everyone is um, turned against God and there's not one righteous, no, not even one. And God ends up dealing with that. And so that's why the prophecy community keeps jumping on every crisis 
um, that it's going to do this and it's going to do that. And then if it doesn't, of course, egg is on their face, but there's no repentance. And that's why the prophecy smack community, as it were, is um, has no credibility. They just say it's going to be really bad and you have to repent now. But but where's the discussion about being the discussion about I am? Where's the discussion about reality? Where's the discussion about why do you exist? I mean, I think a lot of people, if they understood those things, if they had any philosophical yearning for truth at all, if that was ever encouraged in schools, which it's, I guess, not, then, you know, any discussion about, you know, the ontological state of being would lead honest people to the idea of God because the negation of God is the foundation of God, if you will. The negation of God all the more points to the existence of God. And once you get to that ontological argument, then you realize there can be no denying of I am. In fact, we cannot be separate from I am ultimately. We can create an illusion or a bubble that we are separate from God, but God is part of every single thing that has happened. Now, there comes another part of the discussion where God created good and evil, Isaiah 45, and people say, no, God can't create evil. Well, no, God is not hostage to man doing evil. Excuse me. And that teaching has been rammed down our throat from, I don't know how many churches and denominations from the beginning of time. And once you're stating that, then you might as well claim to be God yourself because you know better than him. No, the creation and his story that is from Genesis to Revelation is a mystery ultimately as to why. That's why I did not denigrate the film Prometheus that the Christian community denigrated, because it is a discussion about why and what if. And those are all positive. Stanley Kubrick's movie that we were seated here and there's this black obelisk type of thing or this black rectangle that uh, represents the aliens or the whatever, some force that we don't understand that is seeding humanity or causing evolution. And even that, does not go against faith. And even the movie Prometheus, which was kind of a hackneyed homage to Kubrick, but even that does not go against faith. As I said last time, in the end, the, um, the protagonist gets her cross back. You know, they keep asking, have you lost your faith now that you know that you were seated here by these alien beings, or these beings from another galaxy, from another um, universe almost? And now that you found out that, you know, they, they, they created us, you know, happenstance and then wanted to kill us because I guess they wanted the resources for Earth. They never really made that clear. But the point is, why did they create? And the, and the answer is, well, they didn't. They sort of, you know, it got created, but it wasn't like they fostered people along. The DNA got planted and then, you know, eventually man came along and then man is in this fallen condition. The other question is the question of evil. We always go to Job to look at when, you know, bad things happen to good people, but also, you know, good things happen to bad people. And it doesn't seem to make sense from a justice perspective if God is perfect justice. But then you find out by and by that in the end, perfect justice has been done, but not the way that you thought it would be. And it remains a mystery as to how it all works because it's multidimensional where we're stuck in a dimension where we can't possibly see the whys and wherefores. And if we could see the whys and wherefores, um, I can tell you the answer to why would be unacceptable to humans. And the reason why is because the answer to why is, I hate to sound like Bill Clinton here, but the answer to why is, is. It's like when, when when a kid, you say, well, why is that? And the kid goes, because. Why is that? Because. And why is that? Because. Well, because is a very profound answer. Because that's exactly what it is. The further you go into it, the more you get this from the almighty Yahweh. It's because, and then dot, 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 I am. Because um, you are not really a separate being. Your thoughts and, and feelings and everything that you're experiencing aren't necessarily the end all and be all. 
yet, yet the desires of your heart you will have because I put the desires in you. And, you know, you are to keep fighting against sin and your fallen nature to be with me. And if you overcome, then you will live in a sense of seeding ground. Um, but at the same time, live meaning what? If all is I am, and ultimately the answer is, is, the answer is being, the answer is solidity, solid state, no multiplicity, then that would not be an acceptable answer because we want to go on into our glorified bodies into being like angels and going off and having an adventure, whatever that is. I don't think anyone believes the biblical, the, the church story of sitting around uh, with the saints and having just kind of relaxing and, and being bored. I don't think anybody thinks that's going on. People, humans want action. Humans want, you know, to be a part of the action. And you are a part of the action. You have free will to a, you know, a certain extent. You can choose to repent or go with the way of the world. If you repent, the world will come down on you. If you go with the world, then God comes down on you. So you've, you've got that choice going. Anyway, so the scripture that comes to mind is Matthew 24, uh, 24, verse 25, um, uh, 24, 20, I'm sorry, 24, 24 and 25. If, if they say, well, let me just read that for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you beforehand, if therefore they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, go not forth. Behold, he is in the inner chambers, believe it not. For as lightning comes forth from the east and is seen even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. Wheresoever the carcass is, there will be the eagles gathered together. Now that's a very interesting segue. We go from, here's the coming of the Son of Man and wherever the carcass is, the body, there will be the eagles gathered together, likening, you know, the people of God to eagles. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear a sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, which is then you know, fulfilled in Revelation 19. And he shall send forth his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together for his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. And now from the fig tree learn her parable that when the branch is now become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that the summer is nigh. Even you also, when you see these things, know that he is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things shall be accomplished Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Laden in that, in that language are just a million kinds of levels of possibilities and understandings. And you can take that one, you know, that one section of Matthew 24 and glean the entire Bible from it because it's holographic. In other words, we have the aspect of Genesis and the aspect of Revelation both contained in these scriptures. Um, and then the next, uh, the next line is, but that day and hour, no, it starts off about false prophets, and then look for the, he, that no sign shall be given, and, um, but you will see a sign after the great tribulation, and know that the Son of Man is nigh. Uh, but of the day and hour, no one, not even the angels of heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only knows, and as were the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days which were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall be the, the coming of the Son of Man. Then two shall be in the field. One's taken. The other is just SOL. <laughs> you know. And then you have the five virgins and you have the division of the sheep and the goats and you have the division of the wheat and the tares and you have the division of the world and Babylon and the whore of Babylon versus the saints who was avenged on her in Revelation 18. And then finally the wrath of God, which is the, the Jesus, the king of kings, Lord of lords, the lamb uh, returns with a sword on a white horse 
And um, pretty soon thereafter, after the earth is subdued and after um, the whole thing of the, you know, the, the judgment comes and the thousand years and then, and then finally the, the heaven and earth are, are, are melted away, um, you know, another dimension comes forth. But at the same time, the mystery of all this is in the multidimensional aspect is that uh, the kingdom comes through his people. And this is the mystery. That's why Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within you uh, in Luke 17, 21. And don't look here or there. Don't keep looking for a sign. No sign is going to be given to this generation because, it, because it's ridiculous, because it comes from within. So the work that we do, which is about him and his story, so when we suffer, we don't count it against him. We understand that's a part of the transformation we go through. Suffering causes a... Not in all people, but it causes um, people will either sink or swim. They'll either rise to the occasion and better themselves, or they will sink and wallow in self-pity and, and mourning and be cast off. And that is unacceptable to the world who wants everyone to be included. I drive into Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they have a sign out there called an inclusive community. Well, it's inclusive except for people like you and me. It would not be inclusive. So they're hypocrites, you know, and that and they've always been that way. And that side has always been that side. And their ways have always been their ways. They were the same back in 1962 as they are today. They're the same back in 1948 as they are today. They're the same back in 1865. And they were the same back in the days of Moses, Crossing the wilderness, looking for a homeland. They were the complainers, the grumblers, the backbiters, the gossipers. They were the collectivists who collectively worshipped the golden calf. And, uh, and Moses had to do away with them because God was not pleased. And God, you know, just, you know, they wouldn't be able to accomplish the mission if they allowed them to continue. It would have caused nothing but division, chaos, and destruction as the people of the earth, the earth dwellers, cause everywhere. Like, look... Look what they've done to Detroit. Basically, it needs to be bulldozed. This was one of the most beautiful cities in America and one of the most happening in terms of economy. But they came in, the same people, that uh, the same people in every generation, the same people in every country, and they, put, they just put the torch to it. They kind of they ruined Detroit, and it will be bulldozed in the end. It is already being bulldozed. Whole neighborhoods are being bulldozed. And shrinking, and it's you know will be just like ghost towns. It, it came, it thrived. The regulators and all the people came in to try to quash everybody and all the prosperity. Anything going on there that was they, they quash it. Then there's no hope for anybody. There's no economy for anybody. There's no business owner or employee who can work there. It gets strangled, and then the people when they're done, all they do is they leave and go to another city and do the same thing. And if you don't keep them out, they will ruin your city. Don't keep them out. They will destroy the, the journey of Moses, and he will not accomplish, you know, not that he accomplished his goal completely, but, I mean, he won't be able to continue. So by giving equal measure, and this is what makes me a little bit radical, but by giving equal measure or equal weight to these voices, who are earth dwellers and who lie saying they're all for the middle class and the economy, and they're not. But by giving them equal measure, by giving them a seat at the table, one has welcomed his own destruction. The wheat and the tares will grow together, but they cannot commingle. They can't commingle in marriages. They cannot commingle in government, because if they're allowed in government, they will take over and then ruin the government and then go to another country after that country is ruined. And that's what, they have no solution. It's just about beating down, attacking the other guy, breaking, criticizing, making all the young people especially become violent toward that, you know, whatever it is, the established, the blessed. Tear that all down, but replace it with nothing. But a few elite elites at the top. And then the rest, you know, begging the master for a crumb of bread. And that was communism and that was collectivism and that's socialism and that's, you know, atheism. And that is, um, and that is where it leads. Um, that's also part of the, uh, the whole new age. Out of the new age grew a movement called environmentalism, 
which is also, you know, foisted upon people by, you know, the earth dwellers, the pagans, the earth worshipers and the sun worshipers. And um, basically they use a trick of deception to try to get you in, to try to believe a lie. And then they keep, you know, on you in a kind of a mind control format to keep you believing the lie, to keep you thinking that as a collective, we will win together. We, I mean, here are some of the famous monikers together. We can No, together. We can't, we can't even live on the same block together. We cannot do anything together. It's, um, you know, if you would think that the musicians out there would be understanding because for a musician to actually make any headway today, um, that musician has to push forward as an individual to try to make something of himself or herself in a very brutal marketplace and, you know, sort of duke it out. And they have to be very innovative and, and individualistic to create their own moniker, their own, uh, rather, their own brand and their own thing that, that, that stands out. And then the marketplace will decide. I mean, it's the same thing with anybody else. But, I mean, it's, a, it's, um, you know, it's not based on fairness. It's just like an entrepreneur will try many different things and maybe fail at several of them, but they, they, the, 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 the thing is they have the freedom and the right to continue to try. Well, with a uh, totalitarian regime, which is satanic, no one would have the incentive to try anything and all would wait for their crumbs. And when people start starving and there's no food to feed them, they will be, let, they will be allowed to die. There will be no food stamps in that day. Make no mistake about it, World War III is on it is this and the storm simply is showing that a supernatural thing comes uh right on the election and right on halloween the celebration of which is a veiled they try to make it fun for kids but halloween is basically um a, a time of human sacrifice you know it's a time of the harvest and um they usually you know, what they do is they harvest human beings as well. I mean, the pagans of old have, would have a, uh, a princely kind of guy and they'd nurture him along and he'd be very popular and all that. And then, you know, he'd be like the best guy of the, of the village and then they would sacrifice him at the harvest time at about, you know, like this weekend. And um, this w has been, a, you know, handed down from sisterhood to sisterhood from the beginning, which is in league with, Satan from the very beginning, and then they all the other duties they have are uh, cultivating the bloodlines and and um, and all that to bring about their Messiah, and their Messiah would be the Messiah of backwardsness, which would then ensure mass death, which is also a part of the high priests of this movement, that they would like a world without humans on it because humans are polluting it. Then you start getting into the uh, Gnostics and, and some of that stuff, that matter is evil and Yahweh creating matter is evil and matter should be gone. And, you know, that's, that's where the New Age, the Gnosticism, environmentalism, that's ultimately where it leads is mass genocide and hatred of humanity. New movie out. Let me read a little bit about it to you because I think you've really... <laughs> the only thing I can tell you prophetically is that you... Um, matter, you know, at the same time, you matter at the same time, all the things you see and all the predictions, the Lord is saying, don't necessarily put all your faith and hope in these predictions. This storm will be the worst thing. It will do the worst thing, blah, blah, blah. And then everyone tries to, you know, use it for the, it's, it's just so disgusting. I, I, I don't see how we can watch it. And then, but, but, but foisted on late night talk shows and what's foisted on us is the gloom and doom fear thing. And, um, you know, there's no doubt people hurting and suffering from the storm, absolutely, and our prayers are with them and, and with all humans to, you know, to that, that hopefully that some of these tragedies upon the earth, which it seems like there's one every other day, um, will help people to wake up and understand what's really important here, that living and eating and drinking, giving in marriage and then dying is not acceptable to us. It's not acceptable to us. The answer, uh, the ontological answer of being, meaning is, is also not acceptable to us. But the blessing is we have an opportunity to serve the truth or we can choose to serve the lie. If you choose to serve the lie, then you will be eating, drinking, given in marriage and dying and you won't be getting on the ark of Noah. 
But there is a Noah out there by starring the communist in chief, um, Russell Crowe. And, uh, I, you know, I might as well. There was a little review on it from someone, that, from a filmmaker, that uh, a conservative filmmaker out in Hollywood was on uh, Breitbart. So I'm going to just look at that real quick. And um, you, you can... Uh, God, it's just, it's, you know, I, I hate to even go to the site half the time because it's just so filled with disgusting stories and, and it's just awful stuff. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible. But if you go to Big Hollywood there, you'll see there's a review and very thoughtful review, which of course will um, upset people uh, because any kind of intelligence upsets them to no end. And it's called uh, Noah. And it's a, a film by a, an atheist named um, Darren Aronofsky. I think he's an atheist. I'm, I'm actually not sure if he has any faith, but I, I believe that the, uh, you know, basically this, okay? Um, now, this guy, uh, his name is, um, where is his name? Where is your name? Where is it at the end? Okay, let's go to the end. In the future, it would be a lot better if you just... Oh, Brian Gadawa, and he's a screenwriter for the award-winning film To End All Wars, starring Kiefer Sutherland and Alleged, starring Brian Dennehy and Fred Thompson. Oh, Christians. And on the <laughs> and the author of uh, Hollywood Worldviews, Watching Films with Wisdom and Discernment. <laughs> That's never going to happen. His most recent book is Word Pictures, Knowing God Through Story and Imagination. And so he, what he wants to do is do a, he would like to do a Noah story or a biblical story for real. Okay. So he says, so I've been keeping tabs on a film that um, lives at the intersection. Uh, it's, a, it's a screen, I'm sorry. Um, I'm especially conscious of issues relating to the intersection of Hollywood and religion. So I've been keeping tabs on a film that lives at that intersection, Noah, written by Darren Aronofsky, who's a very talented filmmaker, by the way. If you see his, any, the body of his work, he's you know, really quite a visionary, and, and he does a lot of different kinds of things, and you know, he's really talented. I mean, no one's gonna, so is Russell Crowe, for that matter, very talented actor, and, and Ari Hand, Handel. I've also watched with great anticipation as a post uh, uh, Passion of Christ Hollywood, right, the Mel Gibson movie, um, tries to come to grips with how to reach the massive faith-friendly audience. And I'm concerned about the phenomenon that I see, a film being developed for that audience by people who don't understand it and are destined to fail. When they do fail, as expected, smug Hollywood executives declare, see, that audience doesn't really exist. I don't want to keep that uh, to, to keep, um, I don't want that to keep happening. I want films to be properly developed so that they can succeed. It is in that spirit that I offer my analysis of Aronofsky and Handel's Noah script. I believe that, so he's reviewing the script. It hasn't come out yet. Having gotten a chance to read an updated version of the film script, the, the final film may be based on a revised script with scenes added or deleted. I want to warn you, if you were expecting a biblically faithful retelling of the story of the greatest mariner in history and a tale of redemption and obedience to God, you'll be sorely disappointed well, why am I not surprised? Noah paints the primeval world of Genesis 6 as a scorched, arid desert, dry, cracked earth, and a gray, gloomy sky that gives no rain, and all this caused by man's disrespect for the environment. <laughs> you hear that, Trish? <laughs> Trish is listening as I'm uh, reading this, and, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, she won't be able to handle it. In short, in Anna... <laughs> An anachronistic doomsday scenario of ancient global warming. How Neolithic, seriously, folks, uh, how Neolithic man was able to cause such anthropogenic, catastrophic climate change without the evil carbon emissions of modern industrial revolution is not explained. Nevertheless, in other words, there's no cars, there's no factories, but yet there's pollution. <laughs> Oh, gosh. This just gets worse by the second. Nevertheless, humanity wanders the land in nomadic warrior tribes, killing animals for food or wasteful trophies. In this oppressive world, Noah, played by Russell Crowe, 
and his family seek to avoid the crowds and live off the land. Noah is a kind of rural shaman and vegan hippie-like gatherer of herbs. Noah... <laughs> oh, oh, I'm, I'm trying, folks. I'm trying to hold it together here. Noah explains that his family tries to study and heal the world whenever possible, like, the kind of, uh, like a kind of environmentalist scientist. But he also mysteriously has the fighting skills of an ancient Near Eastern ninja. Hey, it's a movie. Give it a break. Okay, fine. We'll give it a break. But then it goes on. Noah maintains an animal hospital to take care of wounded creatures or those who survive the evil poachers of the land. Can't you just see it? It's laced, isn't it? Just whose animal laws are they violating, I'm not sure, since they are only fiefdoms and warlords and tribes. But be that as it may, Noah is the Mother Teresa of animals. Though God has not spoken to men or angels for a long time, Noah is hunted by recurring dreams of a rainstorm and a flood that he surmises is God's judgment on man. All of God's creatures are dying because of mankind, Noah says, a point with which his grandfather, Methuselah, concurs. People are being killed too, but it's not really as important. The notion of human evil is more than an afterthought or a symptom of a bigger environmental concern of the great tree hugger in the sky. Noah seeks advice from Methuselah, the oldest man alive who lives in a cave. Unfortunately for fighting pacifist Noah, he has to go through the Watcher's land to get there. The Watchers are angels who came down from heaven to help fallen humanity by granting them wonders of knowledge from magic to science to, uh, to stars, metal, and fire. But when mankind turned that knowledge into weapons of war and tools of environmental devastation, God banished the Watchers to earth and turned his back on them. Now they reside as 18-foot-tall, six-armed, grumpy, angelic complainers who resent mankind. So it's man's fault on the angel front. Through tricky movie dialogue, Noah convinces the Watchers to help him, and he receives a magic seed from Methuselah that blooms a magical forest in the desert. It's really quite imaginative and powerful scene that shows God's miraculous provision. Noah uses this timber to build his boat. Hey, wait a second. Wouldn't that make him an evil clear-cutting lumberjack? So the watchers help him build the craft, followed by another beautiful sequence of a magical thread of water that spreads out from the forest and into the world uh, that calls the animals two by two to come to the ark. Like the magical Mesopotamian Dr. Doolittle, Noah, ha Noah has the ability to lead the animals successfully to the ark, and they come from every corner of the earth, and yes, even the insects. Well, they finish building the ark, the rains start, and the evil mobs try to get on the ark, but the watchers fight them off, blah, blah, blah. The movie action and we are at the midpoint of the movie and with Noah and his family on the ark weathering out the flood. What Noah doesn't know is that the evil warlord Akkad snuck onto the boat and plans to kill all the men and rape all the wives to start civilization in, as his own brood of evil minions. Meanwhile, Noah himself has become a bit psychotic, like an environmentalist or animal rights activist who concludes that people do not deserve to survive because of what they've done to the environment and to the animals. There's the meme, and this is the, this is the main meme. When you finally get to the paganism through the paganism to the New Age, from the New Age to the politics of it, it's all connected. The politics, the New Age, the religion, Antichrist, uh, environmentalism, the green thing, you know, global warming, which they're trying to do with this storm and so on and so forth. You eventually get to the conclusion, as the elites have, that humanity should be eliminated from the earth, and then problem would be over. Obviously, they you know, believe it's all about them and their judgment, and they want to play God. And, and in playing God, they want to destroy humanity. And that's a lot of what you see going on behind the scenes. And if you can read the politics of the day, you'll see those people coming out. And the whole environmental trip is just basically a front for we want to really kill humans. The whole communist trip is we want to kill anyone who doesn't think like us. All of it leads to genocide. But anyway, so Noah is one of them. And he's become psychotic. He's really nuts. He wants to go kill all the humans. You know, Noah deduces that God's only reason for his family on the boat is to shepherd the animals to safety, not because he's a human being, not because his DNA was not corrupted by the watchers, by um, which is the Enochian term, the, the by the by the sons of God, so he was pure in his generations. The Bible says, meaning that his DNA was was the only one left that wasn't tainted, 
So he had Noah um, on the ark, and he was trying to save the animals and everybody else from probably more genetic engineering of the animals. And, you know, in other words, this genetic manipulation, advanced civilization, advanced technology thing was happening in that day, but covered up by historians and covered up. You've, you've seen all the alternate history blogs and seen all that and all the evidence there. And evidence is overwhelming that there's advanced civilizations back at this time. Anyway, so the world would be better off with he, without humans. Noah concludes. He decides that there'll be more births in this family so that when they start over in the new world, they will eventually die out, leaving the animals in a human le- in, in a non-human, in a humanless paradise of eco-harmony and peace. His ethical reasoning, the same as all environmental activists, the ends justify the means. Okay, I can't go on because I'm going to throw up. That's when you start thinking, you know, you screenwriters out there, when you start thinking that Hollywood knows something, you got to go back and read William Goldman's book about screenwriting. I forget what it's called now. But, you know, his premise about Hollywood is no one knows anything. They don't know anything. And in, in Washington, no one knows anything. And in entertainment, no one knows anything. No one knows anything in any industry. They just know it when they see it when it works. They don't know and they don't care. If that's the ethos that's going around and people buy tickets, then they'll, they'll push that. And so it's no wonder that, you know, and you wonder, can humanity ever recover from these ultimate um, expletive deleted? Can, can humanity actually recover from these people? And that's the contest. Will God save his people? Um, well, Psycho Noah ends up, you know, coming to the fore. And then he says something about, let me read something about Psycho Noah. And then I'm going to get out of here because I can't take it anymore. I am skeptical of the... (laughs) Perhaps one of the most disturbing aspects of the Aronofsky handle script is the portrayal of God in the moral worldview of Noah. I'm not talking about the fact that Noah is sinful in the movie and that he gets drunk. That is in the Bible. That's not the problem. The problem is that Noah is depicted as attempting to follow God's will in the script, a will that includes the complete annihilation of the human race. (laughs) Okay, enough. And there's all these, you know, people and commenting on Breitbart page here that are, um, they're, they're telling people, they're telling us backwards, stupid people, we must evolve and, you know, accept that there's other ideas out there. No, it's the same old idea they've been pushing from the beginning of time. These are the same people, the earth dwellers that want to destroy humanity. And in the name of saving the animals, they would destroy the animals already with their genetic engineering. These are the same people that diseducate our children. These are the same people that um, basically worship their uh, genitals uh, and, and their desires and their, um, and, and their money and whatnot. These are the same people that have a brutal uh, hierarchical system that one must climb through to be vetted to be able to do these films and also ensures a, a thriving poor population underneath them. In other words, there's the rich and then there's the, the impoverished and there is no middle class. Because ultimately, the whole thing about humanity is humanity is philosophically evil and therefore must be done away with. And, <laughs> and then the world would be saved. Not that humans would be stewards of the animals. Not that humans would be... Stu- and, you know, the... the, the <laughs> Some of the reasoning comes from seeing the evils on the earth themselves and realizing the best thing to do is just eliminate it all. I mean, we've all had moments where we've said, yeah, just end it all. That's it. Where's the button? It can't go on. There's no redemption. No one learns. It's just, it's just, it's a hoax to begin with. There's no point in even talking about it anymore. It's a hoax and it's not going to get us anywhere. So, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die and to hell with everybody else. So the prophetic community, I just hit this thing, it made a spike. The prophetic community and all their wisdom um, have decided this storm is a part of the wrath of God. And they're not, they're skipping the warning part. And I'm, you know, I am, uh, I'm saying it's like a sign The hybridization of it is like a sign. 
the two op the two storms colliding is a sign, like the two forces colliding in the political arena is a sign, and that's the prophetic thing that I'm getting, that I'm putting out there. And no, it's not a big showstopper. Like, you know, I'm not trying to make any money off this, but that's what you know. No, it's not the end. And I can't believe how many blogs were out there that would posit that, you know, this whole thing would be, that this whole thing would be the end. And I really don't know what to say about it. I just, I watch the news and I watch how the political forces are trying to use it for advantage. But I look at the two storms, the cold and the hot, the opposites, collision. And I believe there's a message in that and a sign in that, that there's a collision of societies, a collision of ways, a collision of civilizations, a collision that portends to a world war environment, that portends to, okay, there's going to be a war. A war that will has been raging everywhere because we live in a, a world of opposites. The, the, our bodies are at war within our bodies. The light is at war with the dark. The um, death is at war with life. But you see, the mystery of the creation and why it exists the way it does is the thing no one seems to be really answering. And the reason they're not answering it is because <laughs> that would cause you to think for yourselves. If you think for yourselves, you won't need them to tell you what it means. And I'm not going to tell you what it means because I, I'd rather have the discussion. What about light and dark? What about the mystery of evil versus good in humanity? What about, is there hope for it? It all looks like it's going down. Well, you can count on one thing, that it's not all one way or the other. It's a combination. Everything is a combination. Well, there's one other little point. The storm also portends to an awakening. An awakening of that which has not been there before. People have talked about activation of DNA. About being, some people have prophesied about first fruits appearing on the earth. Um, and I will say about this, signs and wonders of a supernatural nature competing with one another trying to fool you. Remember what Jesus said. You're going to see these signs and wonders. Don't believe it. Necessarily, you're going to have to, as John says, try the spirits. You know, uh, not every spirit is of God. You're going to have to try the spirits. And in so doing, um, you know, I have one verse here. It's... Uh, 1 John uh, 4, 1, and it says this, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world, which then echoes, you know, Matthew 24 perfectly. That's exactly the prophecy of Christ. Hereby know you that, that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. It comes down to a divide, anti and pro. And really, Jesus is also, Yeshua, Jesus, is a aspect of the Lord, but also a word for truth. So anti would be a lie. The collision of the lie and the truth, or the collision of civilizations. And within us, we have a a roiling thing going back and forth where we'll believe a lie for a while, then we'll wake up and we'll say, gosh, I'm sorry, I repent. You know, there'll be that kind of grinding process that goes on. But what's the alternative is giving up and saying, I'm with you guys. And whatever the lie is, they just adopt it. And they all adopt it at the same time. The adults have forsaken the children in this country at this point. That the media, who children should look up to when they go to education and journalist school and all that, the media has shown them that lying and picking personal grudges is the thing that journalists should do and that it's all about embracing the lie, joining a side, choosing a side, and then defending that side with lies and slander 
uh, to the point where people will believe you. Well, people are turning away now, and so they are becoming desperate. When they become desperate, they become dangerous. We're going to lose this thing. we got to do something. Well, let's have a false flag attack. Okay, something to that extent. Now, I was also going to say something about those of you who are beleaguered souls who struggle with this every day because they're, they're not struggling. They're just, they're just running down their game. And you struggle with this every day and you're trying to be judicious in your opinions and you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to think the right thing and you're suffering for it and you're being rejected from your families. Some of you are being targeted for the truth, for your political beliefs, for your spiritual beliefs, for your unwillingness to conform and, and to, to whatever the, the norm. I mean, conforming to insanity is insanity. Conforming to Christ is truth. Conform to Christ, they'll say that you're nuts. You know, I mean, it's, it's that backwards world which they're losing control of. And when they lose control, and then it's like a wounded animal, they become very dangerous. They become very blatant. So now with the blatancy, I'm seeing even more complacency. So I don't think it's a long time before the thing goes off the cliff in terms of a complete disconnect. But they believe that they would like to cause that, the elites, so that they can manage it. But they won't be able to because it's supernatural. Just like the storm came and there are people, and I, I know this is like a huge thing going on, and the real thing behind the scenes is the witch doctors and the wizards caused the storm for Obama. That it's all conjured through magic and witchcraft and through human sacrifice and things like that. To, and this storm is proof that you know, Obama can bring to his own defense a sign and wonder from the, from the heavens that he can wield to his benefit. And if he wins the election on Tuesday, then it will be the storm that won it. And it, people will be in awe of this Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, you know, I'd be uh, um, remiss if I didn't tell you that that's all, you know, that's kind of there. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a thing. And then if you like, instead of wizards and witch doctors, well, just think of little doctors with their, um, their harp, uh, their, their technology trying to steer something. Or think of something like the Watchers coming to aid their, 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 their guy. The Bible says it's all possible that storms can be, you know, and then, then there's the other interpretation, as I said, mine, which is that it's um, the collision of opposites and it's supernatural in the sense that it's anomalous and freakish and they call it Frankenstorm, something that shouldn't be. It's something that's there that shouldn't be. And it happens at a timing of Halloween and the election. It's, it's multi-layered as a message. I would urge you and isn't it interesting how, you know, Romney has been telling the truth about, you know, Obama's policies. And like the last one was the Jeep, that the Jeep is moving, you know, Jeep is, is moving to China and also Italy. Okay. And um, so, so much for the auto bailouts. And, the, the, and, and so, so we have Obama having saved the auto industry, but now they're leaving and the jobs are leaving. So that was a, a correct observation. And, you know, these people will, like I say, destroy business. Then they'll go on to something else. They'll say it's not true, and their followers will say, that's right, Romney's lying. Then the Washington Post vetted Romney on it and fact-checked him and calls the Romney Jeep ad, which he put out there, which some of you probably in the swing states and battle states have seen, uh, correct. But it's too late now because... It doesn't matter about the Monday morning quarterback. The fact is the Obama administration just says Romney's lying every time he tells the truth. Then Obama lies when he doesn't have to lie. For example, he's now saying that he, um, that he ordered them, the military, to do everything they could to save those people, which is an outright lie. Everyone knows that's a lie, but he's gone with it. Um, Romney wrote an op-ed piece that he discussed in the debate saying that uh, the—, the, the uh, GM should go through a managed bankruptcy so the government could give assistance. When he said that in the debate, uh, Obama called him a liar. He was fact-checked that night and uh, the, it was reported to the world that Romney was correct. His op-ed piece said that a managed bankruptcy would give 
government benefits to GM that would assist them in going through a managed bankruptcy, which would have been better for them and for the country. So he explained himself very well. The next day, even after he was vetted as saying the truth, and even after the op-ed piece was republished, Obama went right back out because his people don't fact check and said that Romney is lying, Detroit never forgets, and that um, Romney wanted a total bankruptcy and liquidation of the auto industry, but Obama has saved you. In other words, he went back the next day after everything was vetted and out in the open and said and repeated the lie that he said in the debate again, even after being called on the carpet for it. That is, that's unbelievable. No, that can't happen. That has never happened in my lifetime. No debate, no, we've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. Again, anomalous, supernatural, something that shouldn't be there, something that is um, causing a clash of civilizations. So we look at all these things and we see a pattern. So, you know, those of you digging out of the storm, God bless you and may the Lord protect and keep you and keep you safe. And, um, I think you're going to find that, okay, my heart, I was like, oh, yeah, the storm dissipates. <laughs> sorry. The storm dissipates. I'm sorry. Washington, D.C., light rain. I'm sorry. Will you, prophet, go back online and say you were wrong? It, this came from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. D.C. is the target. Which were well, I played a little bit in the opening sound bites. I can't find everything, but I mean, I found you know <laughs> quite a few things. And what you know, what am I to do? My disgust with um, you, you know, this whole thing of Christianity is just to control people. You know, this whole prophetic community is just to control people, to get money from them, to set up some sort of fiefdom. And, you know, I got some people that I really like, you know, that are really earnest and true, and I don't want to denigrate them. You know, I, my three people, <laughs> but I'm sure there's more. But, I mean, three that I'm in contact with would be Brother Thomas, you know, Govinda, Jonathan Clack, even though, you know, Johnny sometimes has got people around him trying to get them to do his agenda and whatnot because he's like a light and he attracts Lots of, uh, lots of elements from all over, but his heart is, I've, I've met the man, I've broken bread with him, he's, he's completely true, he's completely earnest, he's completely 100% there, he's completely blessed by the Lord, he's anointed and all that, and it's just true. But look at the, the opposition to these three guys. Look at the opposition. You know, um, when he talks about, Cleck that is, when he talks about, uh, the whole, you know, fall of man and being and tying it in genetically and all that. He is absolutely spot on. But there's other forces out there that want to make it something against the Jews or you know what I'm saying? There's 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 but there's another agenda. You know, it's just so tricky getting to the truth that way. So the truth cannot be really gleaned in an intellectual way. People can say a lot of true things, but there's debates going on where there's debates, there's division where there's division. The truth becomes obfuscated. OK. But when God calls a person to speak, you know, I believe it's true. It's just when you, but if you say something that's not true, as there are people out there who are trying to exploit this thing, and you know who they are, they're saying all kinds of things. I've been, you know, when I first heard of Alex Jones, and I'm not going to denigrate him, I'm just saying I've heard him back around 1999. I believe that's the first time I heard of him, or 2000, before the 9-11 thing. Um, it was kind of the same litany of stuff as it was, that, you know, the, you got to go there to find out the truth of what's going on behind the scenes with the elites because they're planning on doing you in. You know, that's been the theme from day one. It's been a litany of that sort of thing and then evidence to support that premise from the very beginning. But what he doesn't understand, and the, the elite is not a monolithic thing, elite meaning the rich, the powerful, okay, the rich and the powerful. They're not a junta. They're not um, 
a collective. You know, they're not a um, monolith. The monolith, that's what it's called. Not an obelisk. In Stanley Kubrick's film, it was called a monolith. The monolith represented the seeding of uh, humanity because nobody really knows the answer as to what that was. So Kubrick brilliantly came up with a monolith to represent that force which seeds man and, you know, a force that could even represent God seeding man in some way. But I know, I know, I know, no, he did. man wasn't just made and woman wasn't made from the rib and, you know, there was monkeys and they looked like humans. And eventually they'd be, you know, I understand. He was talking about evolution. And um, yeah, I understand there's a big thing about that. I, I don't really consider evolution or creation at odds with each other. I think, you know, there's a great diversity of creatures and, and a great diversity of birds, for example. They have different beak sizes and all that and that, that uh, you know, Darwin observed on the Galapagos Islands. And you remember all that from school. It doesn't necessarily um, take away from the idea of creator, creator or creation. It's, and the other thing is no one ever observed a beak being created differently in the laboratory so, you know, it's a legit debate, but I don't think there's a debate there. I just think that's another excuse to start fighting with people. Uh, that being said, I do believe there's a debate politically, but as I said, politics is just a representation. It's a representation of the spiritual battle on earth. That's what it really is. You can't take it, get too in, you know, live in it like a microscope so much. Because it's, it's basically, when you step back, you got, start getting the prophetic understanding about what it all means and who the players really are. These are ancient battles. These are ancient warriors. These are ancient things upon the earth. And um, the good news is God will out, but truth will out. God is another name for truth, which is another name for Yeshua, Jesus, Christ, truth, these this is truth will out. Truth will always out. The liars will lose, but they know they will lose. I mean, somewhere in their psyche and consciousness, they know they'll lose. They'll, they will lose because they will go insane because the lie will break down at some point and they'll go insane. The people that stay true to the truth, Jesus will receive the Holy ghost and receive the baptism of fire and receive the Rima of the ages and receive the truth of the ages and you'll receive the answer to why in your hearts so you'll be satisfied without having to have an intellectual understanding because the secret's going to remain a secret. It's going to remain veiled to the final ounce of separation. And I think that's a good place to stop. That's a good place to stop. Some of you are... Um, You've taken it on the chin and you're taking it all personally. And, you know, you're going to have to step back from it. You know, you, you, this is not the time to be a victim. I have to tell me myself this message because I've been feeling sorry for myself, too. And then I just look at somebody with no legs, no arms, and then, you know, a wounded warrior or something, you know, coming back with his face half blown off. And I'm like, what am I doing? You know, have you ever hit, right? So we can't go there. We must just keep our, you know, keep moving forward. You really just have to put away that you can cry later, but your tears will be dried. Truth will out. The light conquers the darkness. Um, God, Yahweh, Savior of humanity, will save. Completely misunderstood. God hates this. God hates humanity, so he decided to kill him. You know, it's, it's, it's unreal. But if he did that to Noah... If he did that to them, and if there was a flood in Noah's time to get rid of the bad seed, or rather the tainted engineered seed, and then God told, um, you know, was against the, he was against the Nephilim. He wanted the giants killed. Um, and there were giants in those days. And, you know, that whole thing is secret and underground now. Um, but he's against them. And, you know, it's, it's because that's not what he created. So somehow there's this physical aspect. And somehow through your spiritual affiliation, you change your DNA. And this is kind of a 
kind of a thing that you can change by, you can change your DNA by your position, your spirit position, your soul position. And you can change your DNA by your position in Christ. Then there's the activation of the DNA. And it, it's really from, yeah, I told you I would leave. Maybe I should just go. I'll, I'll save this for next time. We'll do a whole DNA show. Maybe we'll have, we'll get, we'll get some people on here and we'll talk about some things. It's just been very slow since, you know, I'm really involved. And I have to say this, I'm so involved in um, uh, producing a, a, a wonderful album for you to really, those of you who really love spirit, the spirit, you know, will love it, you know, and it's, and it deserves to be uh, done the right way. And, you know, there's, there's been issues with the studio. I still have to have a repair. Of, so there's a weird thing I got to get repaired here. But, you know, the studio goes on. And we, um, you know, you can expect that as the times get more intense, you know, there's been, you know, as, it, as, it, as the need comes, there's going to be a lot more in communication, both, you know, music, word, you know, sound is one. Zedja, you know, Zeph Daniel you know, of job, the Lord is one. The studio is one thing. This podcast is not separate from a, a musical or some other expression of sound. Sound trumps image, in my opinion. So we're in a position to create an, a vast array of sounds, some of which may just be nonlinear sounds. For example, if I put some sounds out there in various frequencies, it will affect something and it will open up something. So there's that kind of experimentation and, and more and more things will come out of the studio. It's just like when it's ready, it, it will come out of the studio. But you don't want it to come out half-baked. So we're, we're heading down that path. We're going to get it all done. And um, when, um, you, you'll know about it because I'll have some promotion on the, you know, on the, uh, on the website things have been kind of quiet lately but uh you know i have to come up with some websites and some different things and you know a whole different uh, uh package of things um you know branding of things so that there's a certain specific thing going forth because i do believe there's prophecy and sound there's a prophetic and sound there's a there's a pitching into the spirit which we desperately need in sound we desperately need it. That's why I'm coming, you know, doing show prep and coming forth with broadcasts, with transmissions from the studio because of the clarity so that you understand. The Lord wants you to be pitched into the Spirit and wants you to walk free and float above it all. I mean, just as irresponsible as the Big Lebowski. I mean, just on that level of silliness. Count on it and start dancing around. And I'll see you next time. Zeph Daniel, Zed Jaw Studio. Back next time. Welcome. Welcome. Merovingion. Merovingion. Welcome.
Very 